organizing this international conference. On behalf of the university, I take privilege in welcoming Honorable Justice Adarsh Kumar Goyal, Chairperson National Green Tribunal and former Judge of Supreme Court of India. Sir, thank you for joining the inaugural session and consenting to articulate your valuable thoughts on this day. As a chairperson, Sir has strengthened the institutional role of the tribunal in promoting the nature and regulating the human conduct detrimental to the ecosystem. We are honored to have Honorable Justice Goyal as the chief guest for this international conference. On behalf of the organizing committee, I also welcome our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor V.C. Vivekanandan, sir. Sir always inspires HNLU community to work hard and make tangible contribution to the society. Sir, thank you for joining this session. Let me also take privilege in welcoming Mr. Govind Ram Giri, Miri, Senior Advocate, Chhattisgarh High Court, and Honorable Member of our Academic Council in this inaugural session. Sir, thank you for joining this session and sharing your thoughts on this important occasion. I also welcome Mr. Apurva Sharma, Chairman Executive Committee, Bar Council of India, who always encourages HN fraternity with his support and blessings. Let me also extend heartfelt welcome to our esteemed panelists, Professor Tanjay Gill, Professor at Northumbria Law School, United Kingdom, Professor Paul Martin, School of Law, University of New England, Australia, Professor Elisa Scotti, Professor, University of Makaracha, Italy. Also, I welcome the moderator of the panel discussion, Professor Juan, Professor at National University of Colombia. And my colleague, Professor Urbi will be giving brief introduction of the panelist after the inaugural session. Thus, I refrain from introducing these erudite scholars. Let me also welcome the members of the organizing committee and my colleague at the university, Professors Ankit Awasti, Professor Ranar Nonitroy, Professor Abhinav Shukla, and Professor Urbi Srivastava, and all my colleagues who have joined this conference in virtual mode. Towards the end, I also welcome the scholars, students whose papers are selected for presentation and participants who have enrolled for this conference. Thank you. Over to you, Professor Urvi. Thank you so much, sir. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Ankit Avasti, sir, Organizing Secretary of the conference and Assistant Professor HNLU, Sir Zeal and Perseverance has made the realization of this conference possible. Sir, please enlighten us about the conference. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Urvi. On the World Environment Day, Hidayatullah National Law University, along with the Global Network for Human Rights and the Environment and the Chhattisgarh State Biodiversity Board, is commemorating 50 years of the sustainability movement by hosting an international conference on rights of nature for sustainable development. The concept of rights of nature has evolved over the past decade on a wide range of national and international issues, and it's been reflected in courts and tribunals decisions as well. Rights of nature have been observed as a catalyst for changing global governance to solve critical environmental challenges. The theme of this year is Only One Earth, highlighting the need to live sustainably in harmony with nature by bringing transformative changes. The policy prescriptions, legal instruments, and advocacy will play a significant role in fulfilling the thematic goal. In this reference, the present conference is aimed to bring together people from a range of specialists and backgrounds for a cross disciplinary discussion on rights of nature. We are honored to have Honorable Mr. Justice Adarsh Kumar Goyal, former judge of the Supreme Court of India and chairperson of the National Green Tribunal as the chief guest at the event's inaugural ceremony. We are also extremely thankful to Sri Gobind Ramiri, Senior Advocate of High Court of Chhattisgarh and Member of the Academic Council, HNLU Raipur, and Sri Apurva Kumar Sharmaji, Executive Chairman of Bar Council of India, for being guest of honor of the event. The conference will be organized in two parts. In the first part, there is a panel discussion on the theme of the conference, and uh, we feel privileged to have Professor Juan Sebastian, Professor Dr. Kitanjali Engel, uh, Professor Paul Martin, and Professor Elisa Scotti. In the second part, there are paper presentations in four technical sessions on nine themes, 
Some of the themes are rights of nature, which is right to nature, rights of nature and human rights, rights of nature and greening finance, and rights of nature and international trade. In the last part of the conference, Sri Rakesh Chaturvedi ji, Chairman Chhattisgarh State Biodiversity Board and Principal Chief Conservator of Forest will be the chief guest and Sri Arun Kumar Pandey ji, Member Secretary, Chhattisgarh State Biodiversity Board and IFS will be the guest of honor at the event's directory ceremony. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. Now, I would like to invite Professor Dr. V.C. Vivekananda, sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor, HNLU Raipur. Sir has been a driving force and paragon to all of us to constantly innovate. Sir, I would now like to request you to address the attendees with some introductory remarks. Thank you very much. I hope I'm audible. Honorable Justice Sri Adar Koyal Ji, Sri Apurva Kumar Sharma Ji, Chairman, Executive Council of ECI, Sri Govind Miri Ji, Senior Advocate Chhattisgarh, and Member of ACC of HNLU, Distinguished Panelists today, Professor Juan Rodriguez, Professor Tanjali Gill, Professor Paul Martin, Professor Elisa Scotti, Registrar, Professor Uday Shankar, Organizers, Professor Rana, Professor Urvi, Professor Abhinav, Professor Ankit, colleagues, distinguished guests. As an introductory remark, I just will take a few minutes to interact with you. One person who never ceases to surprise us is none other than Mahatma Gandhi. I think we are reading and rereading and rereading Mahatma Gandhi in many ways. And you find many times what is uttered, whether it has a profound meaning. One such thing came to my mind when we are run up to this program. Once Mahatma Gandhi said, there is enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. This is a statement. Quite often people took it as an economic statement between socialism or capitalism. But if you really profoundly relook at it, then probably it has got a great connotation with what we are having, the purpose of this conference today, called the World Environment Day. It, we took it for distribution of economic resource. Profoundly, Gandhi must have said it in mind, the context, what I call as finite nature. Probably we were thinking nature is infinite, but it is a finite nature in a planet called Earth. That took a lot of scientific studies and you know, moving above the earth to capture it, to understand. Probably ancient wisdom, not just in India, in many parts of the world, probably without all this, they have understood certain levels. And the tribals understood it much more greatly than without any modern technology. But the point is, the desire to consume without any restriction will finally eliminate nature and thereby the human race, which is nothing but a constituent of nature. So someone said, most dangerous species is the human species, you know, among the God's creation. Great extent we are proving to ourselves when we look at what are just within, I would say, about six, seven decades. What is that? The buzzword environmental is there for the last many decades, where serious deliberations take place, but action never matches the pace of such deliberation. So one reason could be trying to get the whole thing innovatively into a legal system. In international law system, whereas national system, could be hope because otherwise you have a very friendly way of, you know, reports and other things doesn't matter. So in that context, this conference about, you know, nature as the central concept, laws to preserve nature, rather than looking at applications assumes a difference in terms of international discourse. We all know that democracy is a great thing. The follow-up of democracy is always, people think not more than five years, whoever is the policy wants, whoever it is. So that seems to be a problem in intergeneration equity. So it requires something which is going beyond nation state. And of course, it has proven very, very clearly to us in the last few decades, thanks to our own science and technology developments, that we are 
one year and also the comp says there is no or plan b there is only a plan a and if the plan a goes out it goes out so very interestingly the science fictions are once upon a in a time considered as some good readable material but if you really look science fictions and how they have predicted certain things i am a fan of isaac asimov who is one of the great science fiction writer and he in his one of his short stories talks about in a distant place there is god sitting and taking reports and one of the report is about planet earth and they come and tell about various things what planet earth has done including the rockets and landing in moon and god is very elated and he says that yes this is my blue eyed boy planet earth and then is there anything negative then they talk about the environmental degradation the nuclear tests and many things and god says now he says it looks like these people are more foolish than what i thought and that's a short story ends this i remember reading 30 years back and 30 years back you know what isa casimo says in his story in a macro level about how planet earth has to understand there is no plan b and we have to preserve nature in that context i uh, this conference uh, undertaken by the faculty with the goodwill and cooperation of international professors and fittingly inaugurated by the national green tribunal chairperson and experienced jurist who has done a human work in the last few years willing uh, you know spending his time and coming and starting he is in a way in a very small contribution of spreading this awareness among the younger generation students and what the legal side can do i in that context um, i welcome from my behalf of the chairperson for heading this and also others who have taken time off like um, the bar council you know uh, the executive committee chairman and uh, our own ac member senior advocate and the other professors who are going to talk with this i would like to conclude that the, i wish this program uh, you know to be uh, bringing in something to the table which will be a continuous process of uh, research within hnlu and also within the legal fraternity thank you very much thank you so much sir for your enriching words moving on we have our guest of honor mr govind ram meri sir senior advocate member of academic council hnlu sir requesting you to please address the audience over to you sir please honorable chairman of the green tribunal honorable justice adars kumar goel my esteemed friend mr puru goswami goswami also my esteemed friend the honorable vice chancellor the star and other participants respected participants today on fifth day fifth june is the day of rights of nature for social development conference day sir it is needless to say that we have to save the earth forest everything international conference on rights of nature for sustainable development is an academic endeavor to celebrate world environment day in by hidayatullah national law university raipur drawing a clue from the slogan of the world environment day 2022 only one earth with a focus on living sustaining sustainably in harmony with nature hnlu invited scholars to deliberate upon the theme of rights of nature for sustainable development in the international conference the conference aims to discuss the efforts of citizens to re-engage with nature and its specific actions they can take to protect to the planet against environmental hazards the movement steers humanity's relationship with nature it conceptualizes on the idea of conferring legal rights to river tanks dams lakes mountains etc scholars describe rights of nature as inherent rights associated with in such ecosystems and species similar to the concept of fundamental rights of human being <clears throat> under article 21 of the constitution of india 
the confirmation of the rights on nature requires investigation of the nature of the legal system needed to preserve and conserve the ecosystem. The legal system needs to recognize the rights to exist, flourish, and naturally evolve, evolve without human driven disruption. The right based jurisprudence potentially promises to secure the highest level of environmental protection, which shall have the legally tenable claims to thrive and flourish. Globally, the movement is gaining momentum for institutional recognition of the rights of nature, which could help in a legal battle against climate change. Edu <coughs> Ecuadorian constitution formally recognizes the rights of nature as Panch Mama. The judiciary has also contributed to acknowledging the existence of the rights in India, New Zealand and Colombia in the matter of protecting the health of the river. The theoretical underprints trainings of granting nature legal standing present the question of form to translate the theory into reality. What shall be the legal process to give effect to persona, <coughs> personhood to nature? Who shall represent nature? How the quantum of damage is to be determined and the process of restoration to the satisfaction of nature as a holder of the right? In the international conference, accomplished by scholars are invited to share their thoughts on these questions in the form of the panel discussion. Panelists from the United Kingdom, Australia, and Italy are articulating the journey travels traveled in the matter of the rights of nature and the path ahead for the effective implementation of the same. The panel discussion is led by a scholar from Colombia. Further, the conference is presenting the platform to the scholars whose papers are selected for presentation before the erudite academicians from the leading universities in India. I firmly believe that the outcome of the conference will drive the discourse on the rights of nature in India and contribute to the knowledge based on subject. Sir, while concluding, I thanks, I thank very much to the organizer and the other participants uh, <clears throat> who has to deliberate much on this subject. Jai Hind, Jai Chhattisgarh. Sorry, I ripped again. Now we have with us today another guest of honor, Mr. Apoor Kumar Sharma, sir, Senior Advocate, Chairman, Executive Committee, Bar Council of India. Sir, I now request you to address the audience. Good afternoon. My Lord. Our former chief justice and former Supreme Court judge and the present chairperson, National Dinsman, Adras Kumar Goyal Chab, Mr. Gubin Ram Miri, the guest of our police function, Dr. Vivekanandan, and the register, and Purbi, ma'am, and other distinguished guests and other participants. Actually, today at 11.45, 11.50, I got that message. From Professor Vivekanandan, he, he was requesting me to attend that valedictory. I told him, I told him that when I have heard about Justice Goel's name, then I told him that I will attend. I have not seen my, my Lord Justice Goel for a long time, so I will attend as a participant. Now that now I got that <laughs> they have invited me as a guest of honor. But today is a special day that you want Ramadan day. When I was uh, the Guwahati president of the Guwahati High Court Bar Association. I have attended so many functions, including Dibrugar, with former Judge Supreme Court Justice Amita Roy and others. Justice, Justice MB Lukur also that time he was present in another function. It's a special day for us. So I, on my personal behalf, I, I might as well congratulate all these participants and I wish the whole program a grand success. That is my last word. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. 
Moving on, we have with us today our chief guest for the conference on rebel justice, Mr. Adarsh Kumar Goyal, sir. Sir's distinguished personality is something we are all aware of, but I'll quickly proceed with a brief introduction. Sir completed his BA honors and LLB from the Punjab University, Chandigarh. Sir was enrolled as an advocate with the Bar Council of Punjab and Haryana in July 1974. Sir practiced before the High Court of Punjab and Haryana for about five years and before the Supreme Court of Indi India and Delhi, Delhi High Court for about 22 years. Sir was designated as senior advocate by the Supreme Court in February 1999 and Sir was elevated as judge of Punjab and Haryana High Court in July 2001. Sir was the acting chief justice of the Punjab and Haryana High Court from May 2011 to September 2011 when Sir joined the Guwahati High Court as a senior most judge. Sir was then sworn in as the chief justice of the Guwahati High Court in December 2011 and was sworn in as chief justice of Orissa High Court in October 2013. Sir was elevated as judge of Supreme Court and assumed charge on July 7, 2014. Sir was then appointed as chairperson of National Green Tribunal on July 6, 2018. Sir, I would now like to extend a very warm invitation to you to take over and enlighten us with your word of wisdom. Over to you, sir. Thank you, my respectful greetings to all present, the dignitaries, the delegates, my old friends, uh, Govind Giri, Govind Miriji, senior advocate, and Apurva. Senior advocate and uh, all the dear students who are present here. First of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to Hidayatullah National Law University for organizing this uh, international conference in collaboration with Global Network for Human Rights and Environment. Yes, today is uh, International Environment Day is being observed for the last 50 years. It is a very significant day when we are talking of environment. It's a live topic. It's not merely an academic topic, it's a live topic because every day we are facing the problems. You have uh, Chosen the topic rights of nature for sustainable development. But Professor Vivekanand just now mentioned that human race is constituent of nature. So when we talk of a right of nature as distinct from uh, all other things, perhaps we are going only in a compartment of nature's right. Nature's right against whom? So it has become perhaps uh, a general trend that we divide everything. Rights of one category has against rights of the other category. That's a type of struggle. But we have another way of looking at it. We are part of nature. We have to live in harmony with nature. There cannot be any conflict. Nature is the mother. Can there be a conflict in mother and child? Can you have a debate on rights of the mother as against rights of the child? So perhaps uh, that's uh, my suggestion that we think of nature and man as one. Our thinking has been of Advaita. We treat all as one, even God and human being as one. That's our philosophy, which Swami Vivekananda propagated. There are serious problems because of uh, this thinking of exploiting the nature. Nature being available here for the man, that has been the thing. It was a thinking which was in conflict with our ancient thinking. 
which always had been in this country, awareness about the environment and the relationship of man to the environment is there ever since the human race came on the earth, came into contact with the environment. And what is environment? Is that we are breathing air. Now, can you have rights of the air as against your rights? Air is having oxygen. Environment is giving you oxygen free. When we are having sunlight, we are, we are having naturally generated water. Air and water can't be produced in a factory. They are created, they are generated, they are part of us, they are part of nature. We are also part of nature. So we have been treating air, water, earth as God. Even Guru Nanak Dev said, Pavan Guru Pani Pita, Arti Mat Samat. So that's how all our philosophers, all our saints in this country have treated. But it was 50 years back in 1972, 5th of June, that the world scientists found that there is a global warming having potential for extinguishing the earth from the, extinguishing life from the earth. Serious threat. Thousands of scientists studied it, observed it, and called upon the world community to come together and think how to save the earth. In our globe, there are thousands and thousands of known and unknown planets. But it is only earth where we have life. Because of nature. There's no life found anywhere else. So when 50 years back, discussion at the World Forum took place in the United Nations. Dangers were discussed of the global warming. The global warming beyond a particular degree goes. We don't maintain the balance required there will be disaster consequences and some of the disaster consequences are here to be seen already. But point is 50 years we are observing Environment Day, International Environment Day. Have we learned anything in 50 years? Is the question. After 1972, there was a major world conference, Rio conference in 1990. And it was found that the dangers have increased. Now they are giving a slogan, act now, no time left. 1997, there was a Kyoto Protocol, then they started having measurable goals. Let us fix a goal. Let every country get a progress report how much sustainable development goals we have achieved. <laughs> so the situation remains serious in the last 50 years. And the achievements are negligible. That's a fact now. Earlier 50 years back, perhaps nobody knew. Nobody was. Common man was not concerned, what is water pollution? What is air pollution? It was taken for granted that you can drink water anywhere from any well, you take out the water, drink it from any river, stream, you take water, from any tape, you take water. But today it's not possible. Today, in certain months in Delhi, there are warnings, don't go out of your home. 
air is poisonous. If you inhale, you will get lung diseases. There are warnings, don't drink water anywhere. To drink water, you will have liver diseases. And this is after this international awareness and a call being given in 1972 and series of enactments which have been measures which have been taken. And there are reasons I will come to. I know the limitation of time, but I will make very few comments. 1974, we enacted Water Act, Water Pollution Control Act. Section 25-26, we said, don't discharge any pollutant in any stream or river or water. It's a criminal offense, there is a minimum sentence. We standardize the water standards, POD level, COD level, pH level, TDS level, etc., etc. Now all these standards are being reached. All the rivers, whom we call Mother River, Ganga Mata, or all other rivers are polluted. There are online water monitoring, water quality monitoring systems. We are finding not only individuals are violating, all governments are violating the we are living in comfort. Comfort is important. Important component of happiness. But comfort is not happiness. In our philosophy, everyone's happiness is your happiness. Sarve bhavantu sukhina. Sarve santu niramaya. Sarve bhadrani pashantu ma kashchit dukh bhaadbari. That's our concept of happiness. You will be happy if you make others happy. Vaishnav janto tene kaye jo peed prai jane. So that's the philosophy which is today required. But what is happening is we are having attached bathrooms. We are generating sewage. But where is that sewage going? We say right to life is a fundamental right. Right to clean environment is a fundamental right. State is under obligation to provide clean environment. This is a public trust vote. Yes. Intergeneration equity. Sustainable development, polluter pays, precaution consequences. All these are beautifully articulated in Supreme Court judgments. Water Act we have enacted, Air Pollution Control Act we have enacted, Environment Protection Act we have enacted, and various rules. Waste management rules, hazardous waste management, e-waste management, biomedical waste management, and every type of waste management rule. We have enacted, we have created rights, we have created obligations. The serious development took place historically. In 1991, when India adopted LPG, it's not like CNG. LPG is liberalization, privatization, globalization. As a response to the economic situation in which we landed ourselves of heavy debt, making it a compulsion to invite foreign direct investments in different areas. But what is the result of LPG? The world having, advanced world having realized the dangers of global warming and environmental pollution on public health, they started giving a go by to polluting activities to the countries which can be economically exploited. That's how hazardous activities in the name of foreign direct investments are shifted. 
and from 91 real dangers to public health have become real in the name of development what is development first of all let us realize before understanding what is sustainable development development and ecology or development and environment will go one side by side hand in hand sustainable don't have development which will destroy the nature for the next generations right but what is happening let us not go into any theoretical concepts of course you are entitled to as academicians but as a common man i am concerned with what is happening on the ground sir we are a digital now world there is a online monitor of water quality there are online air quality monitoring station online water quality monitoring stations throughout india attached to a server at the central level at the state level at the central level with the central pollution board what are those servers showing you these days in winter days in delhi everybody on mobile is frequently checking aqi what is aqi air quality index because they have declared that aqi going beyond a particular point your imminent threat to your health therefore don't go out of the room or install the air purifiers which will be showing the aqi is within the safe limit or it is dangerous so what are the on line information showing if you open the cpcb website what are you finding there is a gradual increase from 1974 after the water act up to now in the level of pollution of water and 351 river stretches are now declared on the government website as polluted on the standards list that means water is not fit even for bathing there are qualities of water water fit for drinking water fit for bathing water fit for agriculture or water which is dangerous for everyone all right a there are a category b category priority 1 priority 2 priority 3 or 5 categories of the and there is a continuous rise in the polluted rivers that is of the rivers for more than 30 years supreme court monitored control of pollution of ganga control of pollution of yamuna and i was also party as a supreme court judge to monitor it and to transfer finally finding it not possible to do much transferring it to the green tribunal and gt where i have further monitored the pollution levels unsuccessfully as on today total capacity of treatment of sewage is 62% which is not fully utilized that means 38% according to the statistics untreated sewage is going directly into the rivers then we have air quality monitoring and there is a concept for air quality control called ncap is a government of india program national clean air program in that program there is a concept of non attainment city nag i'm telling for the benefit of the students you should understand these terms and i will tell you the reasons why i am telling non attainment city is a city where air quality is against the norms or beyond the laid down norms for more than 5 years that means it's pretty bad for situation is 
alarming. And number of those cities is now has gone to 134. Every year it is increasing. There's no chance of it's coming down unless there are serious changes made in our lifestyles or in our policies. So the third thing is a technical term in environment laws as practiced in India is Comprehensive Environment Pollution Index, which is called SEPI. SEPI index is compiled on the basis of online monitoring in respect of notified industrial areas in the country. And why it is called SEPI or Comprehensive Environment Pollution is it takes into account three factors. Air, water and soil. And all the three parameters where they exceed, then there is a threshold limit laid down for measurement of safety. And on that test, 100 industrial areas in the country are declared polluted industrial areas, PIA, based on the safety index, which is scientific, right? And the solid waste management issue emerged in 1984 or 85 when there was a 1994, 95, when there was a plague in Surat. If you all remember, uh, many students may be born post 96. So in 94, there was a very big tragedy in Surat. Large number of deaths took place because of plague. So, public interest litigation was filed in Supreme Court by one journalist, Almitra Patel of Surat, saying there should be waste management systems in the country. And Supreme Court called upon all the states throughout India, what should be the waste management systems? Is that waste which we generate should not be collected at one place. It should have a destination. There should be compostable or biodegradable waste should be separated and composted. Bio non degradable waste, there can be recyclable waste or waste to energy, etc. etc. And if you don't do it, then you are inviting diseases because there will be air pollution, there will be leachate formation, and the garbage collected and kept for years and years will be a great hazard to public health. But there is nothing which has happened. The result is there are more than 1,000 legacy waste, it is called legacy waste, which is collected or compiled for years, becomes a legacy waste. Okay. So we have more than 1,000 legacy waste dump sites occupying huge public space and they are live sources of diseases in the country. Live source of air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution, which is happening in front of our eyes. In Delhi, there are three very big dump sites, Ghazipur, Balaswa, Okhla, right? There may be every city, there will be a serious sign, including Guwahati. We are not able to manage our waste and waste is a danger. I'm not coming to so many areas of biodiversity, forests, sand mining, coastal pollution, mountains, all economic, beautiful country we have. We have very attractive, ecological, ecologically attractive places apart from rivers, our big coastal line on both sides and our mountains. There is another concept in the in environment law which is called carrying capacity. Now supposing you have a carrying capacity, how much load you can carry on your head, you know it. You can't carry more than 50 kg or 100 kg or 200 kg depending upon your capacity. Supposing you have to carry more than that, what will happen? Vehicle has a load bearing capacity. Similarly, earth or eco-sensitive areas have their capacity, mountains. We are raising construction one after the other and recklessly we are raising 
multi-story construction, what will happen? There will be earthquake plagues, there will be tragedies, etc. Et so we are talking of nature's right, actually. Nature has every right. Nature is the mother. Question is, what is our right? Do we have a right to kill nature like that? Nature is giving us something. Sun is giving us light. Wind is giving us oxygen, air. Trees are giving us oxygen. Rivers are gi giving us water to sustain. But how much do we draw? And where do we draw the line? That is the real question. So I have some suggestions because you are a Hidayatullah National Law University. Hidayatullah was one of the greatest jurist and eminent citizen of this country. We had a vision. We had a commitment for people of the country. And work the whole life for that. So can be inspired by his life, his ideas. Do something. I have some suggestions for the university for your consideration. Can you, instead of simply learning the academic concepts, take live issues for the students? What is live issue for the students? You are in Raipur. Can you take these students to some drain where water pollution is happening? Can you take them to a dump site where waste is being collected? Can they study some successful models built by our eminent scientists or engineers or citizens for waste management? Can you show them any hazardous waste site? Can you show them any uh, STP or ETP, sewage treatment plant or effluent treatment plant or CETP, common effluent treatment plant, and how it works? Problem is all the three category of treatment plants. Now, water, polluted water, where is the polluted water going to go? Polluted water is generated in the industries. It is generated in the uh, bathrooms or the useful solid useful waste, as we call it. Or it is uh, uh, so where it is going and where it should go. Either it is to be dried, evaporated, or it is to be recycled or reused. There is a great scarcity of drinking water. But why? Because very easy to take pure water for cleaning of the vehicles, for cleaning of the trains, for cleaning of the buses. What are we doing is digging a borewell, pushing a button, and fresh water, which is a portable water, is being used for those purposes, even for boilers, even for industries. At the same time, the water which is treated in the sewage treatment plant, that is what is happening is the sewage and rainwater is mixing in the drains. They are storm water drains to carry the uh, rainwater, which can be used by animals, which can be used for agriculture, but they are, we are mixing our industrial chemicals into that water. Or Water Act is not effectively implemented at all. But result is all this sewage is going into the drains, ultimately drains connect to the rivers, therefore all the rivers are polluted. So, if the students have awareness, they are tomorrow's administrators. It is not at all difficult to solve this problem, let me also say. It is a very, very easy solutions are available, we are not doing it because of lack of awareness. The law is there, but implementation is not there. Nobody is bothered. Everybody is sitting comfortably in his chair. So sewage which is generated, why can't it be kept separate from the pure water or drinking water? Why it must be mixed in the pure water? But we are doing it throughout the country. So the sewage can be used as a resource for fertility of the land provided it is kept separate from the clean water and 
with whatever type of treatment required, shifted for use agriculture purposes or other purposes. Similarly, industrial effluent, which is generated, which is hazardous, which can cause cancer, which can cause serious diseases, is mixed with the pure water, is being mixed with the pure water. We are not harvesting the rainwater. So the students can see how rainwater harvesting system works. So we have to think of our duties, the rights of nature are there, what are our duties? These are our duties that we maintain the water pure. We maintain the air pure. Why air is polluted? Because we are burning the garbage. We are, we are causing so much, uh, so many things we are burning or so many hazardous things which we are burning which generate carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases. So if we are conscious, we can stop them. Of course, there are vehicle pollution. Of course, there is a dust generated that can also be controlled. But then everybody has to act in harmony and act seriously to contribute. Because if this is life, if you want to breathe fresh air, you will have to contribute to maintain the air breathable. If you want to drink pure water, you will have to contribute to ensure that we do not pollute as institution, as individuals. If you want to have good food, food safety is a big issue. Every food is being poisoned now. And we are forced to consume whatever food is coming. Why? Because food depends upon, food also depends on air, water, and category of earth, insecticides which we are using, fertilizer which we are using is now making food dangerous at some places. Or of, it is reducing our lifeline. It's reducing our, our uh, age and also resulting in huge number of deaths. So these are some of the issues on this International Day and as right, to respect the right of the nature or to respect our duty, which is there, to keep every fellow being happy. We see happiness of others as our happiness. And uh, if we want others to be happy and ourselves to be happy, let us respect nature, let us maintain purity of air, water, and land, and do what, whatever is possible. As an academy, let us study practically live. There is a now, uh, this live word is very popular live news, live discussion, live food. So if you have a live issues, to the students and they also see it live, how pollution is happening or how treatment is happening. I think that may be helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your illuminating, enlightening and informative words. Now, we will be moving forwards with the panel discussion which will address the theme of this conference. However, before we proceed, I would like to introduce our prominent panel members and moderator of the session. We have as our first panel member today, Professor Dr. Gitanjali N. Gill, ma'am. Ma'am has been in the field of academia since 1993. Prior to joining Northumbria University, ma'am had a distinguished academic career in Faculty of Law, Delhi University. Ma'am's research interest is reflected in the thematic issues such as importance of access to justice in environmental matters, promotion of social justice agenda, SDGs, sustainability, and good governance in Asia with a focus on India. India. From 2013 to 2016, funded by a British Academy grant, MAM examined the casework and environmental jurisprudence of India's National Green Tribunal. MAM's research findings were published in the book Environmental Justice in India, the National Green Tribunal 2017. MAM has innumerable publications and has participated in several talks in the field of environmental law. At present, MAM's British Academy Research Grant 2020 to 2023 involves India based empirical research investigating the reach, effectiveness, and impact of rehabilitation and resettlement due to compulsory land acquisition, involuntary displacement, and disregard of human rights. Today, MAM will be having a dialogue on rights of nature from a place based sustainability lens. A hearty welcome to you, MAM. 
We also have as our second panelist today, Professor Paul Martin, sir. Sir joined the University of New England as the director of the Australian Center for Agriculture and Law in 2005. Sir has many years of business experience, including as a director and substantial shareholder in high technology enterprises, as a director of a successful venture capital firm, and as a member of New South Wales Innovation Council and the Australian Government Pool Development Fund Registration Board. Sir was also a senior visiting fellow at the Australian Graduate School of Management for 20 years, responsible for a range of programs in both law and entrepreneurship. Prior to joining University of New England, Sir was chairman of the New South Wales Southern Cashman Management Board. Sir has authored various books and studies on taxation, natural resources and negotiation and has advised local and international corporations and government on strategy in a range of areas including taxation leveraged investment, harvesting and sharing robotics, chemicals, healthcare and high technology. Sir has countless publications and research projects to his name. Sir has also published a book called Sustainability Strategy, which gives a comprehensive understanding of achieving sustainability goals in public sector, natural resource management and business. Today, Sir will embark upon a discourse on legal rights are not enough. How can nature protect its interest in practice? Sir, I extend the warmest welcome to you. We have as our third panelist today, Professor Elisa Scotty, ma'am. Ma'am graduated in law from University of La Sapienza of Rome and obtained her PhD in administrative law and a four year research grant in urban law. Ma'am has been working as an associate professor with University of Maserata, Italy since 2005. And in 2013, Ma'am obtained the national qualification as full professor in administrative law and economic law. Ma'am has been serving as a director of Inter University Masters in Administrative Sciences and Innovation in Public Administration. Ma'am is also a founding member of Global Pandemic Network and member of Steering Committee. Ma'am is a member of Board of Professor of the PhD course in Markets, Business and Consumer at the University of Roma 3, a member of Board of Directors of Italian Association of Urban Law, a founding member member of the Italian Association of Environmental Law, a member of Italian Association of Professor of Economic Law, amongst others. She is author of two books and more than 50 essays on environmental law, public utilities, administrative procedure, administrative justice, urban law, cultural heritage and state liability. Today, ma'am will be having a conversation on rights of nature in the EU. Ma'am, I extend a warm welcome to you. We also have with us today the moderator of the panel discussion, Professor Juan Roderick, sir. Sir is 38th civil judge in the District of Cali, Colombia and a professor at National University of Colombia. Sir specialized in constitutional law from the Haverian University of Colombia and holds a master's in fundamental rights and public freedom from the UCLM, Spain. Sir is also a PhD candidate at the Autonomous University of Madrid, Spain. Sir has published extensively in the field of constitutional law, international law of human rights and environmental law and in journals such as Constitutional Review of the Constitutional Court of Indonesia and other publications in countries such as South Korea, Brazil, Chile and Colombia. A hearty welcome to you, sir. Now, I would like to request Professor Juan Rodriguez to please take over and to invite our respected panel members and kindly moderate the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Urbi. First of all, I'd like to express my thankfulness to the Hidayatullah University, National University of the India, to the organizing committee of this great conference, and of course, to my dear friend Uday Shankar, with whom we have made uh, great collaborations in the matter of the protection of the environment here in Colombia, particularly in a publication called Emergency Climate Emergency. Uh, today, we are gathered together to talk about the rights of nature for sustainable development in the context of the World Environment Day. And this, of course, sets up the importance of this panel. We are here with important panelists, Professor Adush Kumal Goel, who is former Justice of the Supreme Court of Justice and the National Green Tribunal. Thank you for these very enlightened words that you has, have give, given us uh, in these moments. Also to our panelists, uh, Gitanjali Njil, Paul Martin and Elisa Scotti for their contributions that I'm looking forward to, to listen. I'd like to give a very brief introduction of, the, of this panel by 
bringing some light to the context and the state of the art of the law that we have currently in the protection of the environment and making an emphasis on what is the role that the Indian judiciary has in this trend of public interest litigation that made possible this new trend of rights of nature. I'd like to say that as, as Chief Justice uh, Kumal is expressed, one of the problems that we have is that we tend to divide everything. And the first problem that we had in the protection of the environment is that when we set up as the international community, the priorities of the fundamental rights, we divided these uh, constitutional and international guarantees in the concept of the generations of rights. In this sense, we established in the international commitments that there were fundamental freedoms, such as the due process of law, that had to be immediately complied by the government in order to grant the efficacy of the constitution. However, when it came to the social, economic, and cultural rights, but also to the environmental rights, they were postponed. They were framed only as, promise, as promises that governments could fulfill eventually, but did not have to grant immediately. This problem of the division of the, of the rights in generation, of course, made that these environmental promises were indefinitely delayed. However, the jurisprudence of the India in this trend of the public interest litigation, and is a common trend also in the global south, uh, also framed as transformative constitutionalism, established that rights were completely interdependent. That you cannot conceive a right to life if you did not grant a right to health. That you could not grant a right to health if you did not uh, provide the conditions to have a healthy environment. These precedents of the interdependence of rights emerged in the global south, but particularly in the India when it came with the trend of the public interest litigation. This direct enforceability of the social, economic, and environmental promises, of course, put the judge in the center of the discussion of the rights. In the sense that since the public authorities, governments, and uh, legislative authorities were not taking serious these constitutional obligations, and given the fact that the constitution gives actions and litigation tools to make it enforceable, people more and more start to come to the tribunals to ask for the protection of the environment in the connection, of course, as we said, with the health and the right to life. This is the case in the constitution in India, where Article 21 and Article 41, the right to life and the right to a healthy environment, are approached as interdependent rights. People coming to the tribunals, of course, change the whole perspective of how environment is protected. It moves from the focus of public policies to the focus of judicial review. And this is not only in the global south, but now more and more, even in the European Union, as it has been observed in the case of Urgenda in Holland, in the Netherlands. But what were the conditions needed for the judges to have an active role in the protection of the environment? First of all, there had to be a modification of the concept of standing. There had to be an extension of the, poly of the possibilities of who can access the tribunals. The concept of standing would grant that not only you could represent your own interest in the litigations, but you could represent the interest of the community as a whole. This is why it's called the public interest litigation. You do not litigate anymore on behalf of yourself, but you can litigate on behalf of a greater interest. And I cannot imagine of any greater interest than that of the protection of the environment. And this modification of the concept of standing, of course, grants a principle of the law that is the universal access to justice. And this is why in this trend of public interest litigation, you can see even in, in the India Supreme Court cases and the National Green Tribunal cases that they would grant access even to foreigners into the court for the matters of the protection of the environment. In our hemisphere here in Colombia, 
and but also in the United States in the Juliana case, this modification of the concept of, of the concept of standing to give greater access to justice implied that even the children, the kids, speaking on behalf of the future generations could be granted a voice in front of the tribunals that were to decide on their current and future freedoms depending on this environmental sustainability. This modification of the concept of standing and universal access to justice, of course, gave this greater role to the judges in the guarantee of the environment. In this sense, the Supreme Court of India was innovative in setting up a new kind of judicial decision called the structural rulings. And a structural rulings, and a structural ruling implies that the court does not only solve the particular case, but establish orders for the establishment of public policies in the head of the government and the parliament. And also establishes that these decisions have to be follow up in their implementation by the courts that have made that have made these rulings. In this sense, the structural rulings, as Justice Kumar Goel expressed, implied the follow up and the monitoring of the environmental policies. And here, of course, in the case of the India, one of these very important structural rulings was the one in which the Supreme Court of Justice ordered the National Commission of India to study the creation of an, a specialized court on the protection of the environment, and this is the National Green Tribunal. This tribunal, of course, has no similar uh, in, in tribunal in a sense that is the first national broad influence tribunal that we have in the protection of the environment, but this example has been followed up by countries such as Chile, that now has an environmental tribunal, Ontario, Hawaii, and of course, the case of China, where they have also uh, an environmental jurisdiction. This Green Tribunal, of course, implies that the judges in India have understand, and in this they are also an example for all of us, that there has there is a need to give voice to scientific opinions in the tribunals because the environmental issues are not something exclusive of the law. They need to consult scientific reality in order to grant the efficacy of the contents and the, of the contents and the promises of the constitution. Now landing into the topic of the rights of nature, I'd like to express that this new trend is only possible in the context of this public interest litigation, only possible in the sense that judges have been the one establishing the order to protect these environmental legal goods. And that in this sense, it has to be in the courts where you dogmatically construct these limits between nature and men. And in this sense, I'd like to invite the discussion of our colleagues of the panelists with the news that we have from Colombia just yesterday. As I said, this trend of justices establishing orders for the governments to follow up have been followed by other countries, and this is the case of Colombia. And this is why in my country, both the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court has have ruled these kind of decisions, these kind of structural rulings. They have, in this sense, granted rights to several ecosystems, such as the Amazon River and the Atrato River, and also the Otum ecosystem. One of these rulings established that the government should take care of Parque Nacional Los Nevados, and that Parque Nacional Los Nevados, or this National Park Los Nevados, is a subject of right, has rights of nature as a concept, and that in this sense, any public action exercise over this ecosystem should be consulted with the government and the government should act on behalf of the ecosystems, giving them agency and entity in the tribunals. However, this order given by the Supreme Court of Justice to the executive power to protect the ecosystem was not followed uh, with, with, complete, uh, with the complete standards uh, 
said by the decision. And because of this, it just yesterday, the Tribunal of Ibagué has issued an order of arrest to the president. So the president of Colombia today uh, have been arrested or has an order of arrest by the Tribunal of Ibagué for not protecting the rights of nature of the National Park of Los Nevados. So this case of just very recently, as I said, uh, puts us on practice, what are the limits when it comes to the rights of nature? So to not take more time from our distinguished panelists, uh, I'd like to, of course, uh, invite them to tell us about the policies, how they are follow up in the, in the European Union, how they define this concept of nature, whether something that is originally a thing can be turned into a subject, and whether these rights of nature are only conceived for the animals of, as beings that can have feelings, right, that can feel suffering, or to ecosystems such as rivers, mountains, and not things that cannot have feelings. So I'd like to again present our dear panelists. So would like to perhaps start with Professor Jitanjali and Jill, Dr. Jitanjali, so that it can give us she can give us our the the very interesting presentation she has for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, before I really start off, I'd like to thank the organizers, in particular Professor Vivekanand and Professor Uday Shankar, for inviting me to this international conference. The conference is context specific and geographically relevant because Chhattisgarh is a treasure house of nature, including biodiversity and natural resources. And that is why the question about rights of nature become very important. Before I start off, may I request Ankit to please share my slides? I'll be using my slides. Can it be? I hope is it visible, ma'am? Yeah, it is visible. Uh, will I be able to move it or would you be able to move it? I will, I will do that. Okay. So the topic of my presentation today is rights of nature, place-based indigenous knowledge. We are talking about one nature, we are talking about taking people together. And I think in this part, especially Chhattisgarh and areas which are very rich in nature and biodiversity, the place of indigenous people is very important. The way I have structured my presentation is just briefly introducing about sustainability from a place-based lens, and the importance of indigenous and local knowledge, the questions or the complexities that are coming about in relation to the rights of nature and uh, the rights of nature and indigenous people, particularly with the use of words like legal personhood and legal entity. Looking into the notions of reciprocity and governance institutions, and finally, some concluding remarks. Next. Uh, yeah. When we talk about sustainability, sustainability is simply not green or environmental, though it might be the one of the most important ingredients. But within the sustainability, the social and economic aspects play a very important role. And from a social aspect point of view, the place-based phenomena plays a huge important role because this is telling us about the understanding and the deep relationships that people and place have with one another. And this is very central where Hidayatullah University is situated because India is considered as one of the nations which, is, which has a treasure house of biodiversity and natural resources. 
So understanding this people and place-based relationships is so important in order to achieve sustainability. And within this place-based, the nature of the indigenous people, the, their knowledge, their assets, their local resources plays a very important role. Knowledge per se is not only scientific, it has plural connotations and the traditional knowledge and understanding and the relations which the traditional people have with nature plays a very important role. And if we are going to talk about sustainability, the beliefs, values and relational experiences of indigenous people with nature must be reflected towards a move towards sustainability and sustainable development goals. Next. When we talk about indigenous and local knowledge, Burke's 2018 gives a very good definition of talking about a cumulative body of knowledge, adaptive practices, cultural transmissions that are, that are taking place through generations, and its interrelationship with nature, with humans, and with one another. So we are not talking about knowledge which has just been acquired. We are talking about knowledge which is coming from generations which is based upon experiences of the people. And that is so central when we talk in relation to sustainability. And that is why this knowledge has to be captured in order that we are able to develop effective governance systems. Because this knowledge ultimately contributes towards the benefit of the world as these people know how to take care of the land, of the nature, and are very aware of their responsibilities in order to ensure that a balance is maintained between nature and human um, relations. Uh, next. And it is here that I'd like to pick up a few words. Rights of nature have been very well established. There's a huge lot of discourse and this recognition is also ingrained within indigenous and local knowledge. We look to any of the countries, Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, Ecuador, Colombia, India, you name it, Guatemala, you name it, and you, there is a recognition which is, which is coming about that in order we have to have the rights of nature, the traditional indigenous knowledge needs to be respected. The traditional indigenous people have to be a part of in this process. But it is here that I find complexity arising because this rights of nature discourse is being developed through the usage of two or three kind of terminologies. One is talking about legal personhood and the other is talking about legal entity. The terminologies are very Im important for the semantic value because it is these words which are going to tell us to what extent indigenous knowledge and experiences are manifested in the rights of the nature. Let me start off by saying about taking legal personhood. The constitution of Ecuador in 2008 was the first constitution which gave rights of nature to the people. Nature or Pancha, Panchamama has an integral right Section 71 and 72 talk about people and communities play a very important role. And these are the natural persons and communities that are responsible in order to protect the ecosystem. So therefore, in order to have these rights, it's important that the indigenous people have to be involved in this process. Bangladesh in the year 2019, following Indian judgments, 
came up with a judgment saying, River Turag is a legal personhood and has got the same rights and therefore it should apply throughout Bangladesh. Next one. In India, again, the judgments are talking about legal personhood. One after the other the judgments are coming. It started with the Uttarakhand judgments, two of the judgments which came about, which talked about the glaciers and the rivers, Gangotri, Yamuna, Ganges, rivers, streams, lakes, everyone getting the right. But this right was recognized as a part of a legal personhood. Similarly, in 2022, the Madras High Court has also talked about Mother Nature as being, a level, uh, as being a living being and being given the legal personhood rights with corresponding rights, duties and liabilities. 2020, Punjab and Haryana High Court also declared Sukhna Lake as a legal person for its survival. The Madhya Pradesh, Nash, the, sorry, the National River Ganga Act also provides for Ganges with legal personhood. Next one, please. No doubt these judgments are very impressive. Uh, Ankit, next one, please. No doubt these judgments are very impressive. But what do these judgments imply? Where do we define the rights of the nature and legal personhood? particularly in relation to the rights of the indigenous communities. What I feel is that this is a general term which has been evolved. Legal personhood is constructed according to the predetermined human-centric characteristics that travel together with the concept of a person which we identify as natural person. And that is why we are all talking about human rights getting involved into it. But what this legal personhood also talks about is it can be invoked by anyone, everyone, wherever it is. Juan Rakes at the moment talked about standing. And that is where my question is really coming. For the purposes of implementation, fine. This is very good that you are giving this right to everyone. But then there are challenges that are associated with this question of standing. And these challenges are to be identified in relation to what the indigenous or the traditional people are facing. Essentially, this sort of a personhood which is being made, we know about personhood in law because we make everything as a personhood like corporations. But this personhood has got no more moral, social, political, or historical character in its own. We have created this because it's convenient for us to create. The judges have done it. The legislations have done it because this is a mathematical, as what Lawson says, it's a mathematical equation that has become for the purposes of simplifying legal calculations. But the question really, really comes about is, where does this indigenous knowledge fit into? When you're giving rights to each and every person, even a polluter, like an oil company or a mining company can have this right. Where does then the rights of the indigenous people come about? Do they really have a standing to talk before these oil companies? And that's very, very debatable. Again, we have the possibilities of political element coming into picture. Do traditional communities have that sort of a power where they can make a representation in that regard? So when we are talking in relation to nature, and when we are integrating it with indigenous knowledge, this recognition that is being given is good enough. But in reality, when we say from a legal personhood point of view, there is a limited engagement 
which is manifested in the rights of these indigenous people. Let me go back to the Indian examples, beautiful judgments which these judges give, which comes out. But look at the Uttarakhand you know, decision which came about. What did it say? The director Namami from Ganges, chief secretary of the state and advocate general have been declared as the loco parentis of river Ganges and Yamuna. The justification of this judgment, these two judgments, was not given on the basis of the cultural aspects or the indigenous knowledge which the people had. But the justification of these judgments was basically given upon the Hindu notions of deities, which essentially was justified on the basis of faith and morality. So when you make these top up people like attorney general and the chief secretary sitting on those boards to look out for River Ganges and Yamuna or any other natural entity, where do these indigenous people have their place? They are the ones who are responsible because they have got the knowledge, the traditional knowledge, experience, relational ontology that gets reflected in the conservation and protection. So the point which I'm really trying to make here is that though there is a recognition of rights of nature and indigenous people, but the use of legal personhood, which we use in law as lawyers or as legislators or as judges really has an impact whereby it limits the participation of the very people who are affected as a consequence of, of whatever happens in relation to rights of nature. Fortunately or unfortunately, I think one of the challenges, the more I do research on Indian cases, Indian environmental law, what I'm trying to, uh, what I try to see is the loose usage of words that is coming across. Within the judgments, if you're going to open up all these judgments, you would find the use of words, legal personhood, legal entity, juristic person. But then the meaning of these words is very, has a meaning which has an impact on the lives of the people. And that is where it is now the moment for the policy makers alongside the decision makers, alongside academics, to relook into these matters, to have a semantic value to the words that are being used. Because what we are talking about are the people, the marginalized, whose lives are getting affected. And well, once we recognize these people, it's important that we must take their rights to a logical end. Next slide, please. Next slide. As far as the next one is concerned, the second term which really comes about is rights of nature and legal entity. And I think this is the term which needs to be used because if we have to give implementation, if we have to make sure that people, indigenous people are involved in the process of protecting the rights of nature, we need to identify what legal entity entails. The question about the relationship between rights of nature and legal entity is essentially creating a space, a space for the entity, which is a specific ecosystem and the particular groups, which is the indigenous people per se. And that is where you are having the legal rights, which are subject to legal obligations. So what we see in legal entity, the concept of legal entity is, we are not only having the principle of recognition, but we are also having the principle of reciprocity. And as what Juan was talking about, there are a lot of cases that are coming from Colombia, Atrato River, there are rivers, lakes, Amazon rainforest. New Zealand is talking about T. Oliveira um, uh, National Parks as a legal entity. 
Northern Canada is talking about the, the conservation area, which is the Thaidin Mine Park and the conservation area. In all these situations, the courts, the legislators, whoever are the lawmakers are using the term legal entity. And this is so important because we have to understand where the genesis is coming from because it's all about the engagement of the indigenous people with the rights of nature. Next slide, please. And the reason why I say that is we already have a lot of recognition, but what we now need is the reciprocity because humans are in a reciprocal relationship with nature. And it is these human activities which basically are conditioned upon a responsibility in order to ensure that they stay within ecological limits. And despite anything, it is the indigenous people who have these values, experiences that reflect in this reciprocity. And this indigenous relationship mirrors and reinforces itself by treating nature as a relative and not as a resource. And that's where the questions about guardianship and trusteeship come into picture. From Colombia, we have the case where the court said that the Ministry of Environment, alongside seven people from the communities, are regarded as the guardian of Atrato River. So what we are looking here, we are seeing that when you interpret the rights of nature with indigenous people, you are creating legal entities. And there is a distinct and a very pious relationship that emerges where the indigenous people become central in protecting the nature per se because they are acting as guardians they are acting as the trusteeships next slide please similarly in new zealand we have tiawa tupa that's the maori case wangani river where they again have constructed institutions or mechanisms where the voice of the indigenous people is being reflected. Two nominated representatives are coming, though they don't use the word trusteeship, they use the word care and well-being. So by placing the traditional people, by placing the indigenous people and providing them with the voices, that makes a lot of difference whenever we are talking about rights of the nature. Similarly, to Urevara board, where we are talking about the forest area, six members from the indigenous communities are working alongside with the top up people, including the ministries. Again, in Northern Canada, we have an example where the traditional indigenous people work with the ministries in order to protect the rights of a protected and a conserved area. The point which I'm really here trying to make is that it's easy for us to talk about rights of nature, but the implementation, the real implementation of these rights of nature is dependent on the indigenous knowledge. And if we do, do not make these indigenous people as the trustees, as the guardians, it is not possible for us to take everyone into account. A top-up approach of ministers sitting or judges sitting or legislators sitting will never ever achieve the real implementation because you're not giving an opportunity to these people to express and what they are having is ethical and cultural knowledge which scientific knowledge cannot provide. So we are talking here about knowledge pluralism. Knowledge comes from different sources. And that is why 
if we have to make this as a reality, the involvement of traditional people as legal entities needs to be really taken into account. And it is here that the policy makers or the judges have to really start thinking about the semantic value of what they want. Do they want it as a legal personhood or do they want it as a legal entity? Next slide, please. And that is, I, I'd say that for sustainability, we need transformative governance initiatives. And these initiatives are not only based upon recognition, but they are also based upon reciprocity. And what we are now seeing is different sorts of governance institutions wherein indigenous people are central in terms of protecting and conserving the nature. A Trato judgment comes up with biocultural initiative. It recognizes the rights of the ethnic communities, but simultaneously says that because there is a reciprocity, they have to be involved in the process of guardianship or trusteeship in order to ensure that the rights of the nature are being protected. We also have kin-centric initiative, and this is based upon an e ecosystem approach where humans are considered as an extended ecological family that shares ancestry and origins. So what we are looking here is a relationship, a relationship which is based on experiences, a relationship which is based on traditional knowledge, which enhances and preserves the ecosystem. And a very radical way, and some of the authors have talked about, is anthropomorphism. Rather than hue nature being centric, what they are talking about is detecting human personhood in non-humans. It is very ambitious because it starts about a relationship which encompasses both the intrinsic value as well as instrumental users. So what they are saying is rather than nature being centric, human beings become centric or human beings are uh, to be considered as a part of non-nature. Nature has got so many intrinsic values and its uses. It's very radical, but who knows? A radical judgment might bring about a change in that regard. In the end, last slide, uh, I would like to conclude by saying it's a very timely international conference, but then if we want to have just and livable futures, rights of nature discourse are very Im important, but they have to have a semantic value. We need to understand because we are talking in relation to indigenous people. It's just not the recognition, but the reciprocity of their contribution through their relational experiences plays a very, very significant role. So understanding their value, appreciating, understanding, and applying their value and knowledge is needed to breathe life into a legal entity. And that will help in elevating the status of nature for all people and respect the laws of indigenous people. And this really feeds very well with sustainable development goals because sustainability and sustainable development goals says no one should be left behind. So in this process, we have to recognize the importance of the indigenous people and start thinking about what terminology we need to use in order to make the rights of nature a concrete reality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jitanjali, for your very relevant thoughts. Indeed, the central question of, or one of the central questions of, of this new category of the rights of nature is who effectively can exercise this guardianship of these ecosystems, whether has to be the international community or those indigenous people that have this ancestral knowledge and this ancestral relationship with the specific ecosystems that are being studied and protected by judicial decisions. 
thank you, doctor. Now I'd like to give word to Professor Paul Martin. Professor Paul Martin will also talk uh, talk about legal rights, whether they are enough and how can they how can they protect nature interests in practice. Doctor uh, Professor Paul Martin will point out some reflections or of who will act for nature or will nature only be a proxy for people who will pay and how to protect nature and what institutional arran arrangements are needed to make rights for nature meaningful. Professor Martin, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much. Um, I've been trying to connect my PowerPoint, but it doesn't seem as though that's going to work. So I will just have to talk to my what I have in my slides, and then um, I'm quite happy to share them later on. With such a, a fantastic panel and such experts who know so many things about the doctrines of different countries, I thought it would be foolish for me to pretend to any sufficient level of competence engage with the doctrinal issues. And I thought to myself, what is the contribution that I can make that would be valuable, but which wouldn't just simply be going over ground that people have covered? And Professor Guild has just covered quite a lot of the material that I might otherwise have covered. So what I'm going to focus on is practical effect. And what can we do to take the innovation, which is rights of nature and particular rights of rivers, and make it fully effective? Now, uh, Justice Goal up front talked a lot about the problems that exist in India with rivers. I could talk just as strongly about what's happening in Australia. And we've done quite a lot of work with Brazil, a lot of comparative work on implementation. And we've got a study with five countries all looking at the implementation of international rules, principles. And the thing that these all show is that countries are fantastic at converting broad concepts into legal instruments. Surprisingly good at that. They are less good at converting that into institutional arrangements to implement. They're far less good at actually doing the implementation and overall pretty appalling at using the law to substantially change the relationship of man to the environment. And if we look at river rights, rights of rivers, what we see is some quite radical innovation and people having high expectation that that innovation will lead to efficient change. Now, I would like to look at the innovation from an innovation theory perspective, not from a law perspective. And if you look at the way that computers evolve from large, slow mainframes to desktop to high powered PCs to now We've even got machine generated algorithms where the software is not written by a person, it's written by a machine. The, the paradigm that starts with is very clumsy and it gets mature over time. Where we are at with rights of rivers and rights of nature is we're at the pre-paradigmatic paradigmatic stage where it is great ideas, many different versions, very clumsy and highly unlikely as it currently stands to do what people expect. So what I want to come to at the end of this presentation is something about what we need to do to make it more likely that we will rapidly evolve this legal principle into something that actually works. First point, many people think rights of nature are radical, but legal rights of non-human actors are not radical. They are reasonably well established and have been for some time. So I cannot point to a creature which is competition, but I can easily point to laws that protect the interests of, of competition. 
And so you know, the step towards protecting rivers is not as great as a step towards protect, protecting an abstract economic concept. There are four main sources of river right paradigms, and Professor Gill has just dealt with one of them. One is infusion from Aboriginal cosmologies, and there are multiple cosmologies, and so there are multiple norms from Indigenous people. I do worry um, a bit that we are expecting Aboriginal people or Indigenous people, or First Nations people, to save us with their cosmologies. Um, I think it might be asking too much of them and actually uh, bypassing the, the responsibility of the rest of us. The second source is infusion from West, Western and other philosophies. So the, the philosophers arguing about the intrinsic rights of nature. The third one is constitutional infusion, where a constitution, for example, requires recognition of, of indigenous forms or the interests of future generations or the rights of nature. All of those can lead to a version of the rights of rivers. And the last one, and I suspect the most powerful driver in many countries, is it actually is driven by a political response uh, about perceived failure of duties. And people grab a concept to try and resolve that. And I certainly think in the Australian situation particularly, any potential rights of rivers will come primarily from a recognition of the failure of existing law and a desperate desire to find what looks like a credible theory. And there we start going to Aboriginal cosmology and things like that. I'll come to that in a moment. So I've said we are in a pre-paradigmatic stage. There are multiple versions of rights of nature and rights of rivers. Implementation is very clumsy. There are some some fantastic examples of it being done well, but mostly it's not being done well. And it is having relatively limited effect with a few fantastic examples that are different from that. So I ask myself, where to from here? So where do philosophy and rules meet with ecology and society? Well, laws are concerned with norms and processes, so with institutions. And social movements are concerned with culture, politics, and that. The environment, ecology, interacts with society through transactions. Law does not have any effect until it directly gets into transactions by either changing the institutions or by changing the cultural activities. And so the question I ask myself, how or when or will rights of nature get to the point where it is reflected in the transactions affect rivers. So if you look at, assume that part of a right of a river is a right to be healthy, then you would expect that it would, to, to get involved in transactions in a, in a positive way, it would have to change things like how farmers work, how residents, how townspeople work, how industry works, how we change the shape of landscapes, all of these things, those transactions would need to be shaped by an obligation to control harm that mirrors the right of the river in some way. And if that doesn't happen, if we don't achieve system change at the day-to-day -day transaction level, then we will end up with a vacuous concept of the, the, the right of the river. And that's not much different from human rights. There are plenty of human rights that exist that are not implemented because they don't get into the day-to-day -day transactions that affect human welfare. There's no reason why rights of nature would be any different unless we do something different. So when you look at that, you start to think of rivers in a system sense, going from rainfall, pure water coming down, water being stored, extracted, discharged. What you see is that there are many, there are many biophysical flows, there are many transactions, and there are many actors who make decisions. Farmers, industrialists, land, industrialists, landowners, residents, politicians, and many others. And if we don't change their decisions, then we will get nowhere. So that means it's not enough to have good norms. It is just not enough. 
unless you can change administration policies, economics and politics, then you will have a very slow path towards what we all want, which is more sustainable use of the water. So for rights of nature to work, you need good doctrine, that's progressing, and you need institutional entrenchment, and that's progressing far more clumsily and more slowly. So future river rights, what paradigms do I think will be needed? The first is that human rights, when they're effective, often trigger restoration and compensation. So something has to be given back. So in Australia, with the Mabo decision, which is a high court decision, a radical decision, now almost 50% of our landscape is under Aboriginal ownership. That's a radical change but it was had to be a kind of a giving back or rather recognition that Aboriginals still own that land. Similarly, for, for a rights paradigm to work, there also probably has to be violation for, for breach. It's a long way, we're a long way short of having a mechanism to trigger restoration, compensation, maybe some punishment, but to be fully effective, river rights need to do that. The second is that the, the link between rivers' rights and the duties of citizens to respect those rights has to be, that link has to be there. So we probably need to end up with a duty to respect the legal rights of nature. So the other side of that balance has to be in place. Third thing, there are so many different versions of what river rights are or what they might be, that probably we'll have to end up with a point, a point where there is some form of synthesis or codification of the different forms of river rights paradigm so that there is a, a clearer understanding in society of what this might mean. The next point, um, and uh, I think it's really important, you can't, mostly when people talk of river rights, they are actually not talking about rights of rivers. They're talking about rights of people to use a theory to pursue the interests that they care about. That might be environmental, but it might be an economic interest in a river. True rights of nature would require respective significance, someone who can simply act for nature. Sometimes this exists, but often it doesn't. Often we rely upon the individual citizen ultimating, ultimately taking that action for, for the environment. And worse so, we often require an Indigenous citizen, and in most countries, the Indigenous citizens are those who are least likely to have the capacity to do what is needed. So we probably need to end up with strong representative litigants. We also need to have a developed um, learning about how to make river rights work. And there is, we're a long way from knowing how to make this work systematically, and that's something we need to do. And the last thing that has to happen for this to be effective, if we have to move from the narrative about doctrine and you know, lots of wonderful dialogue, but we have to move to accountable norms or rather societies and parts of society that are truly accountable for effective norms. We're a long way from that now. So I'll finish off with an Australian example. Australia does not have a right of nature or river rights. We do have a lot of nominal fragmented rights and duties that could approximate that. So we have environmental and water laws which place obligations on water users. We do have landholder duties in some jurisdictions. For example, in Victoria, there's a general landholder duty of care. And in many states, there are duties of care about control of invasive species or other harm. And we have an existing on paper Aboriginal rights system that's in expanding into water rights and cultural flows. So we have some components. For the last few years, we've had a very reactionary um, political system that has wound back a lot of the, um, a lot of the environmental protections. But we are now heading into a period where there are going to be some catalytic events. So in 2024, there will be a full review of the main of the, the rules governing our main economic river system, the Murray-Darling. 
it's clear that our national environmental legislation is going to undergo reform and it'll be genuine reform based on a pro-environmental government. A um, significant move in Aboriginal land and water rights are going to happen. And there is a, a document called the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which is a, an Indigenous statement of policies that's going to be given some effect. So things are going to move in our jurisdiction, but like every other jurisdiction, we have to get rapidly to the stage where we move from talking about the abstract theory in a fairly confused way to the point where we're talking about a coherent system for changing obligations in order to give real effect to rights. So I think I've done my 15 minutes and I think I will now stop. Thank you very much, Professor Martin. Uh, I'd like to agree with you in the sense that uh, rights of nature are not in itself something radical. Uh, you could only see the example of corporations, right? They are, as you say, uh, they, there has been a recognition of legal rights for non-human actors, also for this case of the corporations. And of course, you point out that between the obligations and the promises of the international in instruments and the constitutions and the implementation of practice of these promises, there is a very big gap and that we also have to question ourselves on who is about to bring bo a voice to these ecosystems and whether we have an anthropocentric view of the ecosystem or an ecocentric view of themselves. Thank you very much, Professor Martin. Uh, I'd like to give now the stage to Professor Elisa Scotti, who will talk about the rights of nature from the focus of the European Union. Thank you. Um, before starting, I'd like, if it's possible, to share my slides. Um, I, I can see um, the possibility on my screen. Um, Course, Thank you. Um, may okay. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so let me uh, start by first of all thanking, uh, thinking, uh, thanking all the organizers of this uh, conference uh, and uh, the Adatla National Law University and in particular Professor Uday Shankar for inviting me to this uh, really interesting uh, discussion. Uh, my uh, my presentation is about uh, uh, right of nature in uh, the European Union, and uh, uh, this is uh, mm, uh, uh, this is the case of a, a legal system that uh, now is uh, behind the uh, the great revolution that we uh, are observing all over the world with the uh, right of nature uh, movement. Mm, it, uh, in, the, in this revolution, uh, this revolution uh, has less uh, success in Europe. And uh, it can be, uh, can sound weird because uh, um, as we know, the uh, Europe is uh, under a green transition. Uh, we uh, have a European Green Deal and uh, uh, our target and commitment is uh, climate neutrality by 2050 with uh, a lot of different uh, strategies uh, in the environmental uh, uh, in the environmental field, uh, and they are summarized in the last environmental action plan that uh, uh, reaffirm the commitment uh, of climate uh, uh, neutrality and uh, put a lot, uh, put uh, uh, many priority objectives. Uh, uh, so climate neutrality, but. Uh, also strengthening resilience uh, and protecting biodiversity 
and uh, um, I don't want to uh, to list it all the objective, but the point, the starting point, is the strength of the uh, choice of the uh, European Union and uh, the European Member States. So we know that uh, the European Union is. Uh, as a shared competencies on environmental matters with uh, the member states. So uh, the strategy is complex uh, and the minimum level of protection is designed at uh, the EU level. Uh, the uh, member states can only improve the level of uh, environmental protection. So the starting point of the uh, choice of the European Union is fundamental to understand the trend. And but it is also important uh, um, the uh, not only the specific uh, objectives, but uh, also the premise, because the, the last action plan uh, is based on the recognition that the human well-being and prosperity depends on the healthy ecosystem. And uh, uh, it, uh, um, it is uh, important uh, from uh, our, uh, our point of view, so from shift the paradigm from the na right to nature pro to the rights of nature. Um, we highlight that uh, uh, this uh, uh, movement uh, is, is less success in Europe. Let's try to understand uh, uh, the reasons. And uh, uh, we know that uh, in uh, uh, our culture in Europe uh, is uh, um, human-centered uh, for uh, our uh, tradition, for uh, our humanistic culture, tradition, vision for the enlightenment, for rationalism, for the current uh, nihilism, and also for our Christian roots. So we put at the center of our concern uh, the human being. And uh, another point that uh, um, could uh, uh, in some way obstacle uh, the, uh, the acceptance uh, uh, and of the uh, rights of nature strategy is uh, the high level of uh, environmental protection in the EU legislations. We will see uh, later why. And also the sustainable development approach um, I will come back later on this uh, point. And uh, also another point is the approach to environmental uh, protection uh, as a public interest more than a right, a human rights. Um, the environment uh, is seen as a common and uh, human rights uh, is something that uh, came later in our mindset. Another point is the central role of uh, NGOs uh, in accessing judicial review under the Oros Convention. And uh, it is uh, something that uh, could uh, uh, in some way um, uh, uh, create less emergency in the access to justice. Uh, and the need of uh, a popular action, uh, Axio Popularis. Uh, so let's move uh, on uh, what is uh, happening in, the, in Europe, because the trend is um, obviously uh, changing in this uh, moment, because uh, we um, have a lot of uh, 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 scholars, uh, uh, politicians, uh, and also cultural movement uh, um, in favor of uh, uh, the recognition of rights of nature in uh, in Europe, and uh, uh, it is uh, really important in this moment because uh, we are under two different crises: the post-pandemic crisis, uh, but also 
uh, energy and economic crisis induced by the uh, well-known international crisis and it can put at risk our environmental target. And also we are uh, under a digital transition that uh, should be based on uh, ecological principle. And so uh, the, um, also with the uh, environmental degradation, we can observe in this moment something that is moving in our mentality. Um, one example, symbolic example, is the uh, Pope Francis' uh, encyclical letter of 2015 that uh, uh, recognizes the intrinsic dignity of the world and uh, and it is an important, uh, an important sign of uh, changing in our, uh, in our culture. But uh, we can uh, see also a movement uh, and changing in the European legal landscape. And uh, um, we uh, can uh, we we can mention a lot of different uh, European rights of nature legal initiatives. Uh, we have a database um, of nature initiatives uh, organized by two universities, Sant'Anna School of Advanced Studies in Italian University and the the University of uh, Amsterdam, and we have also a UN database, uh, but uh, focus on the uh, European initiative, we have the um, database uh, I mentioned first. And according with this uh, uh, research, uh, we, uh, we see um, um, uh, around 50 initiatives. Uh, uh, initiatives with the different uh, actors, uh, political actors uh, at different levels, at the EU level, at national states level, and uh, at uh, municipalities level, and so local levels. So we have also NGOs, but also religious entities that uh, are acting in favor of uh, um, adopting this new, uh, this new uh, vision. And also, we um, have a variety of subjects of natural entities. So, first of all, rights of animals, but also rights of nature in general, and uh, or rights to specific natural areas. Mm, the same is happening all over the world with rivers, lakes, trees. And uh, uh, but let's uh, uh, try to uh, to see um, with more details some, some example. I will try to be brief. So we uh, have a constitutional uh, development. So uh, linked to the green constitutionalism legislation litigation petitions uh, and also programs of political parties in uh, Europe. Mm. Yeah, we have to um, be aware that uh, uh, just a few of these uh, initiatives in Europe are going to uh, to 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 succeed. Uh, for example, we have uh, an ongoing process at constitutional level in Finland, in France, in Germany and also at the EU level, because we have the proposal for the adoption of a charter uh, of the fundamental rights of nature uh, at the same level of the European treaties. I will come back on this um, charter for its importance. Also in Italy, we uh, in Portugal and in Sweden, and we can mention uh, in Italy that we can uh, say that we had a half victory because in uh, last February we amended uh, the Italian constitution included in our first part, it means in the values uh, um, the uh, Republic protects. Uh, the environment, biodiversity and ecosystem, also in the interest of future generations. And also the mention of uh, rights of animal, but uh, uh, 
it is some there is a mandate to state law to regulate the protection of uh, animals uh, so um, we uh, can say that it is not the recognition of rights of nature but it is also an important approach because uh, is not the rec recognition of the human right to health environment, uh, the environment, biodiversity, uh, the ecosystem uh, are protecting in the interest of a future generation. So I think that uh, is something that uh, um, is an important step. Um, also in legislation, we can see some proposals, uh, for, for example, uh, uh, proposal in Romania uh, about a law mm, for uh, that to consider dolphin non, dolphins non-human person. And uh, for example, the proposal in the uh, EU to include the ecocide in the environmental crime directive. Unfortunately, as uh, uh, the, the proposal, uh, the last proposal that, uh, does not uh, mention, uh, does not include the ecocide, but uh, the uh, debate is uh, ongoing. And uh, um, we have a lot of municipal initiatives, but uh, uh, for uh, recognized rights of uh, rivers, uh, of lakes, uh, but also uh, in general uh, rights of nature in, uh, in local communities. Uh, um, but the point is uh, uh, if they are legally binding in some way. Let's see um, against this um, uh, positive and normative back backdrop what uh, is happening uh, in uh, the field of litigations. So we have uh, different uh, case, uh, cases that, uh, um, and uh, um, for uh, the rights of nature. We can mention, for example, uh, an action in Belgium uh, um, that tried to uh, affirm the legal standing of protected trees, uh, but uh, the court uh, rejected the argument, uh, and the same uh, happened in Germany for uh, legal standing for piglets. Um, against law that uh, allow uh, castration without the application of anesthesia. And uh, in um, both uh, uh, cases, uh, uh, the court, court alighted that uh, only, um, only human being has a capacity to all the rights and to have legal uh, standing. And uh, uh, we need a specific provision for uh, legal uh, personhood, uh, such as for legal person that uh, have their personality uh, granted by law, expressly by law. So there is, uh, um, uh, there is this, uh, positive approach of uh, uh, European Court and also the uh, European Court of Justice, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union as this uh, uh, is creating barrier uh, to uh, legal standing and to um, action uh, uh, for protecting nature. And the same uh, approach, uh, we, can, uh, we, we can find the same approach uh, um, uh, in uh, uh, environmental law cases uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. We have a lot uh, in uh, our, uh, the, the, Euro the European Convention of Human Rights uh, doesn't include the rights to, uh, the human rights to a healthy environment, but uh, the court uh, is linking this right to the light, right uh, of life uh, and the right uh, uh, for private and family life. Uh, and so th uh, the uh, European Court of Human Rights is deciding uh, 
a lot of cases uh, on uh, environmental protection. So on uh, city dams, uh, incineration plants, industrial installation. But uh, the point uh, is the strong link with uh, the um, the um, individual, the individual harm. Mm, we have a, a specific uh, element limitation, which is the uh, so-called direct victim requirement. And so there, we need this link, and um, we we can find some. Uh, yeah, important step uh, in the recognition of the uh, legal standing of uh, NGOs uh, when the case is uh, common to communities, and uh, it is uh, um, one way the uh, way the, uh, the the court is trying to uh, um, uh, to to open his mind to uh, the right of nature. Uh, trying to uh, avoid uh, uh, this strong connection with uh, the uh, individual harms. Uh, so uh, we, um, the, the conclusion uh, about legal standing um, also of the Oros Convention Compliance Committee is that uh, is a, a widespread lack of uh, um, access to uh, to, to justice across uh, Euro Europe, uh, and it is uh, uh, one point for enforcement, uh, for legal enforcement in the environmental, uh, um, environmental matters. And uh, um, um, uh, looking at what uh, legal uh, scholars are doing, we um, have to, uh, the, our starting point is that the, uh, the prevailing view is the recognition of the importance uh, and of the European environmental legislation, which is uh, uh, extensive, uh, surely, and valuable. And so uh, the uh, common starting point is that uh, there is no need to write new laws, to design new laws, but only to apply existing ones. It is the mainstream in Europe. Um, so, for example, uh, authoritative, uh, authoritative scholars uh, um, uh, said that uh, it's important to try to uh, promote access, uh, access to justice before national courts, and uh, that uh, environmental law uh, reflect in uh, ecocentric perspective, and that uh, the uh, rights talk could uh, distract from these uh, ecocentric perspectives that. Uh, um, yes, it's uh, present in our, uh, for example, biodiversity legislation or wildlife uh, legislation. But uh, um, uh, is uh, um, the, the idea that uh, even if uh, we have a strong building of environmental law, we uh, need uh, to uh, strengthen uh, it with the rights, uh, with the, the recognition of rights of uh, nature. We have two important study of the European and the economic uh, uh, at the European level. One is the um, 2020 study of the European Economic and Social Committee entitled towards an EU, uh, a EU charter uh, for the fundamental rights of nature. And it, it uh, aims at underpinning uh, the adoption of this uh, charter at the uh, um, constitutional, European constitutional level. Um, okay, there is a, sepo, a second option uh, uh, to adopt uh, an interinstitutional non-legislative act, uh, and it could be a second best. Uh, um, 
easier to be reached but uh, not uh, non-binding um, uh, and so uh, but uh, the, the, the importance of the uh, the charter uh, of fundamental right is uh, to uh, adopt a new vision new paradigm so to abandon the current uh, sustainability model uh, and uh, adopting a rights uh, of nature uh, model, which is uh, different because uh, we, uh, in the second, with the new vision, we recognize that uh, we are inside the, uh, the, um, the planetary boundaries, uh, inside the nature boundaries. Uh, and uh, inside the green circle, we have to put our social and economic uh, and our economy. And so it means that uh, they are recognizing that we uh, surely need to implement uh, the European uh, legislation, but it is not enough. We have to switch our paradigm we have to redesign a law and uh, uh, to have to adopt uh, a new uh, new view. Uh, first of all, it means uh, uh, overcoming fragmentation, so uh, the sectoral view, and uh, uh, to adopt a more integrated uh, policy. Uh, and uh, it means uh, uh, also to abandon uh, and to adopt uh, ecocentric uh, view and it is not only uh, uh, an ideological point of view but it means uh, principle of eco law so the proposal of this study is really clear uh, introducing substantive rights of nature uh, identifying new rules and methods uh, of interpretation uh, of designing and interpretation and application of the law especially with within the discretionary power of uh, public administration and states and uh, uh, also uh, the obligation it means uh, the obligation to take into consideration the right of nature in all eu policies not only before courts. And uh, also mm, we have a specific uh, rules, uh, uh, so they are asking to include in the European principle of environmental law, the rule of non-regression, the rule of resilience, the rule of in dubbio pro natura et clima, the rule of sustainable democratic method, so inclusion uh, and the, the rule of uh, responsibilities toward uh, nature with, and it is important from a legal point of view, with the reversal of the burden of proof. Mm, okay, and uh, after this uh, study with these important findings uh, and proposals, uh, we have a, a second study in the, the uh, EU, a study uh, committed by the EU Parliament that uh, is, uh, um, uh, is based on a skeptical point of view. Uh, first of all, uh, the question is, uh, uh, right of nature is really a shift of paradigm and uh, uh, the solution is to minimize the role of this uh, uh, new movement and vision and as a, a, a new label in the system. So only a formal and ideological uh, change. And uh, uh, the, uh, the point of this, the, uh, um, the idea of this study is uh, uh, to uh, the, that the main pro uh, problem is uh, um, is enforcement, and uh, one consequence of this approach is the last uh, proposal uh, that I mentioned before uh, of the revision of the um, environmental crime directive. Uh, the first idea was to include the crime of ecocide, but uh, 
Lastly, and surprisingly, the last proposal does not recognize the crime of uh, ecocide. And, uh, uh, but uh, the, uh, these uh, studies um, full of also of uh, pragmatism. And uh, uh, so the starting point I said is uh, the need to enforce uh, environmental, mm, in, environmental European environmental legislation. So uh, it admits that uh, from this movement, uh, an important finding is the recognition of legal personhood. That means for us uh, to strengthen the, um, the legal standing of NGOs and uh, to introduce legal standing for each individual's uh, actual popularis popular action. And uh, it uh, surely can strengthen the, uh, the enforcement of uh, European environmental legislation. And another important, interesting, and uh, I conclude with this, an important recognition from this skeptical uh, point of view is uh, the recognition of the importance of the principle of non-regression. And it is, uh, mm, I think, uh, in, in important, uh, uh, an important, uh, um, an important point because uh, in this moment, uh, as uh, um, I said, uh, we are uh, we are in uh, uh, we are facing two important crises: the post-pandemic crisis and the, the energy crisis in Europe. And uh, uh, we are also uh, facing a digital transition, and all of these uh, situations can put at risk uh, uh, our environmental goal, but also our uh, environmental achievements. So um, the non-regression uh, uh, principle, I think that in this moment is really important, uh, is important to improve uh, our uh, steps, but also it is really important uh, not uh, avoid weakening uh, our environmental laws. So um, I think that uh, I uh, took uh, to uh, time. So I thank you again for uh, let me joining this uh, conversation, and thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Scotti, for this very relevant insight you bring us from the European Union law. Indeed, the starting point from Europe is the Judeo-Christian tradition and a ethnocentric vision of the law. And from this point of view, of course, uh, the contribution is radical, radically different. You have this goal of climate neutrality by the 2050. And I would say that now to this challenge is added that is also a matter of national security, of European Union security, to achieve these clean energy goals, given the situation of the war. And also, in this sense, becomes more relevant the typification of this crime of ecocide and whether this is an interest that could be also even framed as an international uh, crime, as some of the scholars have uh, proposed. Thank you very much, Professor Scotti. Now we open the panel for the Q question and answers. So I will I'll give the word to Professor um, to Professor to whom who is coordinating the Q and A. Uh, I'll take sorry. over, sir. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for such a profound discussion by all the panel members and the moderator. I am sure we've learned a lot today and our horizons have expanded in terms of rights of nature and sustainable development. Now, I would like to request Professor Abhina Shukla to take over for a Q&A session. Thank you, uh, Professor Ulvi. Uh, I would like to ask uh, all the panelists a question that is whether the realization of the rights of nature require political process or legal process. And I would request a brief comment uh, from each of the panelists. And uh, considering the paucity of time, I would request all the panelists to be very brief in this regard. So. I'll take it first. 
I think there is no definitive answer which you're saying. It's a combination of a lot of factors which come into picture, right? Political will is very important in environmental matters because this political will is also a reflection at the international level of what the government is committing to it. Laws make things possible. So, you know, you just can't say it has to be either this or that, but it's a combination, but this combination has to be taken to a logical end. If it's not taken to a logical end, then we always have the problems of implementation. That is what I think. Thank you. So I'll follow on from that. The lawyers naturally focus on instruments, legal instruments, but for effective rights of nature, we will also need to have mechanisms to make it feasible, particularly for Indigenous people, to do what is required. So we'll have to go beyond worrying only about legal instruments and legal institutions and also worry a lot more about the practical interventions that are needed. Thanks. Okay, um, I totally agree with uh, uh, the previous speakers and uh, I only would like to add that uh, in uh, Europe there is a study uh, about public opinion and uh, it demonstrates that uh, uh, more than two-thirds of people is in favour of uh, rights of nature. And I think that is an important starting point for effectiveness. Thank you, uh, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to request uh, Professor Urbi to take it time. Thank you so much, Professor Abhinav. I would now like to request Professor Juan Rodriguez to deliver the concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Professor Urbi. It is indeed our responsibility to do the concluding remarks of such complete and genius presentations by my college, my colleagues here. Uh, however, I like to stress out some common points that were talked about by all of them, which is also the center of this discussion, which is the, con which is the concept of a standing. The concept of a standing from a procedural perspective means who is able to act in front of the courts and advocate for rights, but in the context of the rights of nature means who talks on behalf, on behalf of the ecosystems. We all come from a, a starting point, of, a common starting point of view, which is that nature cannot talk by itself. It needs someone to do it. It needs someone to act in front of the courts. And this is, of course, the problematic issue because we cannot decide unilaterally who has a greater interest over the ecosystem. So we have, of course, the presentation of Dr. Jitanjali. She talks about the rights of indigenous to represent the ecosystem, but also we hear that from the European Union, Professor Scotti points out that NGOs have this, also this right to advocate for the environment. So this is a great question, of course. Also, the other question that was pointed out and successfully answered in this conference, and that is the premise of the question of the standing, is the vision of the law that each nation has. This is a global problem, but of course, as we have seen, each country approaches this issue differently. First, we have the European tradition, as Professor Scotti pointed out, comes from a Judeo-Christian point of the law, which is essentially ethnocentric, homocentric. Why? Because in the Old Testament, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the man is made in the image of the God and is placed above the other beings of the nature, animals and ecosystems. While in the rest of the world, 
the situation is not necessarily the same. Of course, India, I would understand, that has a much more comprehensive uh, approach to the environment, more equal. The Indian law, law tradition sees the environment as part of the humanity and not the humanity as above the environment. And in this, if we are going to point out to a solution, we have to be respectful of each point of view of each of these nations. And in, in this matter, I'd like to quote uh, Onuma Yasuaki, who used to talk about, who talks about the uh, civilizational spheres, that there is a Islamic point of view of the law, there's also a Christian point of view of the law, there's an Eastern point of view of the law, and that each of these local views have to be consulted in order to define something universal, such as this goal that the international community is has fixed, which is the, fixing a crime of ecocide and fixing the environment as a global legal good. So we come back to the question of the guardianship. Who can exercise the guardianship of these ecosystems if we recognize that they cannot talk by themselves? This is also relevant to achieve the problem that Professor Martin pointed out very successfully, which is that these promises established in international law and constitutional have very poor efficacy. So we have uh, institutional uh, proposals, institutional mechanism, but they are very non-efficient when it comes to reaching the environmental goals. So we have to come back again to define who will exercise this representation, whether it would be the indigenous or if we can consider the environment as a global legal good that we all that we which whom we all can relate and we all have this responsibility to protect i think that from this is part a starting point and this dialogue between jurisdiction we can construct a public policy hopefully an international public policy we need more international agreements but we need this jurisprudential dialogue that it comes with the work of the academics, such as yourself, that have uh, made the effort to study comparative law, comparative experiences. And I think that in this sense, this conference and the fact that it has been organized from the India is particularly important because India has been a leader in the judicial protection of the environment. And as we can see, there is the growing interest, in, interest from Australia, from the European Union, and even from Colombia in their president. And in this sense, I would just thank and invite uh, our colleagues to continue to contribute in this very interesting debate. And as a proposal made in, that we can make as high as last remark of this conference, stress what Judge Kumar Goel uh, pointed out, that we all have the duty to guarantee the conditions of living of ourselves, but particularly of the future generations. In this sense, the future generations could be the way, could be the inspiration that we have for this work. Because when we talk about who can exercise the guardianship of the ec ecosystems, we have to think not who does it, but for whom you do it, right? So the indigenous people and advocates, they exercise the guardianship of the ecosystems, but they don't do it for the ecosystem as itself, because the ecosystem doesn't talk, doesn't feel, but they do it for the future generations that are entitled by the constitutional promises to enjoy these ecosystems that we currently enjoy, but we don't have the right to dispose for others. Being said that, I'd like to thank again to all of you for this very successful event, and I give again the word to Professor Urbi. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Rodrix. Now we have almost reached the end of this enriching session today. However, it will be incomplete to conclude it without a statement of gratitude. Hence, I now request Professor Dr. Rana Navneet Roy to deliver a vote of thanks. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Professor Urvi, for providing the virtual floor to me. I feel privileged.
to have this opportunity to propose formal vote of thanks for this uh, uh, inaugural come panel discussion today. Uh, friends, first and foremost, uh, a very good afternoon, a very good evening to one and all present here. Uh, I express my sincere gratitude and thanks uh, to Honorable Mr. Justice Adarsh Kumar Goyal, Chairman, National Green Tribunal, and the Chief Guest of today's inaugural ceremony, who has uh, spared his valuable time and uh, graced this occasion. And uh, I am very sure that all the participants are very much benefited by his words of wisdom. And uh, uh, I also express my sincere gratitude from my personal behalf as well as from the behalf of university fraternity and organizing committee to the guest of honors for today's inaugural, come, inaugural ceremony, Mr. Govind Ram Miri, senior advocate, Bilaspur High Court and member of Academy Council of HNLU and Mr. Apurv Kumar Sharma, executive chairman, Bar Council of India. They have graced this occasion by their presence. They have expressed the words of wisdom and uh, we are really grateful to serve because on very short notice they have accepted our invitation and they have graced this occasion. And, and next I would like to thank from inner core of my heart to all the three panelists who have joined this virtual forum from abroad as panelists. First, I would thank to uh, Professor Dr. Gitanjali N. Gill, Professor Northumbria Law School, Newcastle. Secondly, I will thank to Professor Paul Martin, who is Director, Australian Centre for Agriculture and Law, School of Law, University of New England. I am also grateful to our third panelist, Professor Elisa, who is Professor, University of Magarata, Italy. Actually, all three panelists have discussed and deliberated in detail about the today's theme. And there is no need to again say, because we are running short of time, that how important this conference was and how importantly they have expressed their wisdom on the on this very pertinent uh, theme because uh, today this is the time when we have we have to think about our earth there is no substitute of this planet we can have other things as alternate but we cannot have earth and sustainable development is the only solution so all the three panelists have really discussed uh, this theme uh, in the nice manner and that would be very useful in uh, coming all technical sessions. Some technical sessions are already going on and some technical session would be starting soon. So I am very sure that all the delegates, all the paper presenters would be keeping your words of wisdom into their mind and accordingly they will be uh, discussing today about the problems and probable solutions of uh, this problem by which we all are really struggling. And uh, uh, I am also very much thankful to Professor John, who has very rightly and critically has uh, proposed the concluding remark. He is Professor, National University of Columbia and 30th Civil Judge of the District Kali, Columbia. So he has uh, very nicely uh, concluded the today's panel discussion and actually we have started our conference firstly with panel discussion and then we have kept purposefully the four technical sessions in that so many papers should be presented uh, throughout the India and uh, some participants, some paper presenters are from abroad as well. Now uh, I am duty bound to propose my thanks to the faculty organizing committee consisting of Dr. Ankit Avasti as secretary of this conference and some of our professors, namely uh, Professor Avinav, uh, Professor Urvi, Professor Amitesh, and some other professors. Uh, I would be failing in my duty if I would not say thank to our student organizing committee, 
who, who have also worked tirelessly. And uh, most importantly, I am thankful to all the participants who have who are participating in this conference from different different law schools because participations are free and uh, I am very happy to learn that uh, so many participants 100 plus participants are participating in this conference so we, we we are getting very good response in this so I am thankful to all participants who have joined from different different law schools and different institutions and I am also thankful to IT staff and support staff who, who, who has been working despite this uh, fact that today is a holiday, but then also they all are working for a smooth conduction of this event. And uh, at the last, but far from least, uh, we organizing committee members are thankful to our respected star sir and honorable vice chancellor sir, who have conceived this idea of convening this international conference on very short span of time and on very relevant theme. Uh, so really, it uh, this uh, event was not possible to be convened without uh, the support, guidance, and encouragement from the star sir and vice chancellor sir. And uh, I, I would also take this opportunity to thank all the faculty members of our university who, who are contributing in this conference in different, different capacities. So, uh, if I am forgetting any other's name, so I take this blame, but uh, whether uh, someone's name was taken or not, I am thankful for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Professor Ruby, for further uh, proceedings. Thank you so much, Dr. Roy. Just I would like to request all the panel members uh, present here to just keep their camera on for a couple of seconds. We are trying to capture a group picture of all of us. Done. Okay, thank you so much. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Elisha. Thank you, Professor Yuan. Thank you, Professor Gitangli and Professor Martin. Professor. Thank you, Professor. Go virtual. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Uh, with the permission of Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, and respected star, sir, I declare today's inaugural session as concluded. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you Professor Rai. Great.